Jocelyn and Tom McMillan farm in the Bega Valley. But they run their pasture-raised egg operation on other people's land. The business model was forced on them when they started out young and keen, but cash and land poor. We didn't have a farm to go to. Um, you know, we didn't have family land that we could have used. Um, yeah, it was, the, it was the only way we could have got into it. And here we are four and a half years later. Yeah, we're doing pretty good now. <laughs> yeah. The couple move their mobile chicken coops wherever the landowner wants, providing free fertiliser with zero carbon footprint. He's very happy. <laughs> He's been very happy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just becomes more productive at the end of the day. It's just, you can grow more grass, um, just to put it really, really simply. We were the first, or the last one into drought, and the first one out of drought too. So as soon as we got rain, it was green here, whereas, you know, other farms around the valley, it takes a little bit longer. Their 5,000 hens turn off 3,500 eggs a day, and for two years, they haven't been able to meet demand. When they wanted to expand, their neighbour, Barry Irvin, Bega Group's executive chairman, found his problem, an embarrassingly weedy, unproductive grazing paddock, was the Macmillan's free solution. All right, cool. They've expanded their business. We've got a more healthy soil, more vigorously growing plants. We haven't had to use chemicals to, to, to knock out the invasive weeds and we haven't had to use artificial fertiliser to get the soil where we wanted it to go. Um, so it is that, in that case, that is a virtuous circle. Barry predicts he'll soon be competing with other dairy farmers who'll be prepared to pay the Macmillans to park their weed-eating, soil-renovating chickens on their land. That will encourage more, more enterprise here. It'll be another reason to establish yourself here. When farmland serves multiple uses for multiple users, it's called enterprise stacking. To Barry, it's a small but perfect example of circularity. It's circularity, but it's a virtuous circle where everybody wins. And that is from an economic point of view, from an, an output point of view, and from an environmental point of view the mountain ranges themselves. Barry's been on a quest for circularity for several years. It was the view from his veranda that convinced him the ideal place to trial circular economy principles was in the Bega Valley. Bordered on three sides by mountains and one side by 220 kilometres of ocean, the natural boundaries contain a single council, airport and port, and there are just two roads in and out. We can measure everything in this valley. What we should be doing if we're really having a go is convert this valley to be entirely circular. We could use this for proof of concept. We could, we could actually prove things up really quickly. We could also prove that things failed and didn't work really quickly, and then we could share that knowledge because we've got to solve it across the state, across the country, and indeed across the world. Circularity appeared on Barry's radar when a Dutch banker warned him the language around sustainability was old. And if Australia didn't adopt the practices of a circular economy, it would fail to reach net zero goals. In the Netherlands, the target isn't net zero by 2050, it's to be a fully circular economy by 2050. I'm curious, so I said, I didn't actually know what that meant, so I just said, tell me more. It was probably a light bulb moment for me. The Netherlands is one of the leading countries in the world to begin moving from a linear economy, where goods are made, consumed and disposed of, into a circular one, where finite resources are recovered, recycled and reused. It's about keeping materials in the economy for as long as possible at their highest value, designing out waste and pollution and then regenerating natural systems. Supply chains traditionally go one way and end in landfill. Circularity reverses supply chains to recover materials for reuse. Lisa McLean is the CEO of Circularity Australia. If there's more gold and silver in a tonne of iPhones than a tonne of ore from a gold or silver mine, you can still be a miner, but you'll be mining it out of iPhones instead. Governments around the world are moving towards circular economy. The World Economic Forum has embraced the World Circular Economy Forum. It's the only economic framework we have 
to grow our economies in a resource and carbon constrained future. So it's actually all we've got. We better make the most of it. Lisa McLean says Australia won't reach net zero without going circular. We're focusing a lot, which we need to, on cutting carbon and that renewable energy transition, and that's great. That's going to manage about 45%, 55% of the emissions we need to cut, but the remaining 45% is what circular economy is needed for, because that's the embedded carbon, that's the carbon that is embodied in materials. Circularity converts have a saying, that once you see it, you can't unsee it, as it makes so much sense. Once Barry saw it, he was on board, but not just for his company, Bega Group. Changing Bega cheese will be nice, but it won't shift the dial. Changing the Bega Valley will begin to shift the dial. Uh, sharing what we learn here with everyone else and saying, here it is, it's yours, please use it as you wish, uh, that will start to shift the dial. Barry set up the Bega Circular Valley project with the goal of making the Shire Australia's leading circular economy by 2030. He's confident residents will see economic, environmental and social transformation. 10 years, I would be going 30 to 50% is where we should be looking. We need to be catching up with the types of targets that the Europeans have and great initiatives are backed with action. Bega's former mayor says if anyone can make it work, it's Barry, who's known for his drive, influence and connections. They've got Rabobank on board, KPMG, Deloitte, Charles Sturt University, University of Wollongong, the local council, the state government, the federal government, you know, they've brought all of these players to the table because we know that change happens in regional communities and we don't want to let it happen to us. We want to be at the forefront of it. If you think about the natural advantages this valley has, we, we, we shouldn't be looking to be average, we should be looking to be better. Barry's not known for being average. When the former banker and fifth generation dairy farmer joined Bega Cheese in 1991, it was a small dairy co-op. Now it's a listed company turning over more than $3 billion a year. Barry wants Bega Group to be Australia's best corporate example of circularity. So we are extracting the milk minerals in the past that were going down the drain. And going He's given the environmental manager Manjit Randawa a big job. Reduce emissions, water and power consumption and find valuable uses for waste. But future projects, we are looking at all the organics turning into biogas and on that growing some seaweed. Um, and all these projects are live projects uh, due to circularity. His latest success is this evaporator, which removes minerals from liquid whey waste. This brings around $3,000 to $5,000 a tonne to site. Um, it's, a, it's a good, uh, good project to do and it paid for um, within, within a year or so, paid for itself. Yeah. Yeah. The Bega Group's been circular without realising it for some time. This cheese plant's boiler runs on wood waste. It keeps power bills down and solved a sawmill's disposal problem. What's left is fly ash. So that's all that's left after yes. burning at what temperature? Uh, this will be burning at 750 degrees in our, in our burners, in our, in our burner, uh, creating steam for side. Sending two tonnes a day to landfill costs the company $200,000 a year. Now it's delivered free to dairy farmers as a lime replacement. And Wollongong University is investigating if fly ash can cut CO2 emissions in cement production. So you've got everything from mild cheese to tasty to strong and bitey. And, uh, and the easy projects are done. Most plastic and cardboard packaging is recycled and factory wastewater is diverted to pasture next door. So daily we generate around 1.2 million litres of wastewater and that wastewater is at this stage is beneficially reused to grow grass. But as opportunities in the blue carbon world emerge, it's expected wastewater will go to higher value uses like onshore seaweed farms. Dr Pia Winberg says these farms producing ingredients for human and animal consumption could use it all. 
We've already ironed out the whole process of growing a unique Australian green seaweed. We've done all the food safety work. We've even done clinical studies. We know how to dry it. We know how to put it into foods. And yes, we've actually achieved our first export this week. So we have the system and now we just need to make it bigger for Australia. It should be at least as big as 10% of the wheat industry. It's got huge potential. Uh, seaweed is a massive crop in Asia and we're girt by sea in Australia and really haven't scratched the surface of this opportunity. It does create a new crop with so many more benefits and bringing nutrition from the sea into the food chain. Things like omega-3, iodine and that sort of thing that's missing. So yes, it should be a part of our land to sea cycle of food. The launch of Bega's circularity project has marine scientists buzzing. The increased collaboration and funding will stimulate innovation. It's really exciting when you can actually herd the cats and start to communicate across silos of both industry, academia, government, and collectively say, let's make this happen. Our blue carbon researchers are absolutely ecstatic. To get people understanding what's happening under the water and how that is actually fundamental to saving our planet, that's going to be a huge benefit, both for our researchers to tell their stories and for the public to actually understand what's worth investing in. The goal is for a coastline dotted with new seaweed and kelp rearing, growing and processing operations on and offshore. And while increasing local wealth by creating jobs in new industries is a key goal of circularity, so too is habitat repair. The regeneration of kelp is, is essential for creating habitat for marine life. It also creates nutrients in the water that uh, make the ocean healthier. And we can actually harvest quite a lot of that kelp to make useful products uh, that make us healthier and make our land healthier as well. South Coast Sea Urchins is a textbook example of circularity. So they can chomp straight through the stems of these massive kelp plants. The row of the invasive long spine sea urchin is a delicacy, so it's worth paying divers to bring the environmental vandals in for processing. We can't overfish them, in fact we, we specifically target them because they are a pest. So they're an endemic species, but they're massively overpopulated, which means that they're killing all of the, the kelp um, and the seagrasses which abalone and the rock lobsters need to grow in. More than 90% of the pest is waste. Once the only disposal option was landfill, which cost thousands in fees. Someone saw some value there though, and now remove it for free. Will you be able to expand the business and get more of these spiky things out of the ocean? Yes, yes. The answer is yes, yes and yes. Massively scalable um, business. We've got divers ready to go. We're setting up more and more infrastructure to enable us to keep growing the business. And the businesses which take our waste, they need more and more by the day. It's going into compost. Brothers Tim and Kyron Crane started their fish and timber compost venture five years ago, the first company licensed by the New South Wales EPA to use putrescent or rotting seafood. I can see in this pile abalone, mussels, oysters, yeah, there's scallops, sea urchins. Yeah, so we have yeah, we've and got some fish. Yep, we've got abalone. While small, last year the business saved 500 tonnes of marine waste from landfill. The leftover shells are being crushed and trialled as a lime substitute for pasture. Yeah, yeah. It's got a little bit more to mature yet, but yeah. it's getting pretty close. I'd say if we can... it might take us five or six weeks to, to do our pasteurisations and then they'll be ready to go to the next stage. How many pasteurisations does it need? It needs five pasteurisations. It needs to be it needs to be over 55 degrees for three days, five times, pretty much. The startup caught the eye of Pentark Forestry, as well as supplying wood waste. It's invested to help the business expand. Oh, Pip, we are thrilled to be part of what the boys have done here. Um, they've been working on this for years, and it's an absolute showpiece for the circular economy here in the Bega Valley. 
this could be a mainstream large-scale business. And that's why we're investing in the business in our facility in Eden, where we'll build a big shed, larger composting area and a packing line, and also into bulk delivery so we can supply local and remote agricultural businesses as well. This is being tested now, so that's right to go. OK. So that, Tim uh, can't believe the pointless and costly fate of such a potent fertiliser. We import a lot of stuff from overseas to, for our farms, yet the best stuff we're putting in the landfills, it's ridiculous. It's, you know, something's got to change. It's got to change now. And we've had a really big bite at it and we've seen the potential of it. The products for home gardeners, but the cranes are developing a dry version that can be rehydrated for agriculture. Dairy farmer Toad Heffernan volunteered a test paddock. He added water, sprayed the fish tea, and then watched his cows. So obviously, mm. pardon me. Um, so obviously, the cows know exactly what they're eating. They know what they want better than we do. Uh, and they actually moved across back onto where the fish tea was on the heavy dose. He was surprised when sugar levels in his grass were higher hours after spraying, and when a frost hit the whole farm, he was astonished. The fish paddock that we'd done the trial on wasn't actually frozen, and I was blown away. Maybe, you know, we can grow our kaikia maybe three or four weeks longer into winter, and then maybe start it growing a bit earlier coming out of winter. Toad's plan is to stop using artificial imported fertilisers and go local. And now I think if we could literally st stop all the cartage coming in here with the trucks and, and everything with the carbon footprint um, and, and get our fertiliser from the coast, I mean, 20 minutes away, you know, that, that to me is golden. I think Barry's a very smart man and I think he's jumping on this, the circular economy thing, at the right time. For Barry Irvin's plan to work across the Shire, he needed the biggest dealer in waste, council, as an ally. Running landfill is expensive, so council didn't need much convincing. While 48% of the region's waste was recycled or turned into compost, 19,000 tonnes was dumped here last year. And unfortunately, that number is increasing every year and it's increasing larger than our population growth. Um, and so what that tells us is that our um, residents, our, our population here is per person becoming more wasteful. Uh, it costs us $307 currently um, per tonne to landfill and that economic value is not productive. It doesn't lead to anything else. So it's, uh, it's a pretty awful outcome that there are things that have value that are going in there that people think of as waste rather than thinking of them as a resource that can have a life um, through some kind of circular or reuse system. Tim believes if residents and businesses are enthusiastic about circularity, the percentage of waste to landfill can be cut from 52% to single digits. Council's wide awake to the treasure in its trash. And this is full of um, rare and precious metals. So there'll be gold in this, there'll be silver. Uh, you can see pretty obviously a lot of copper wiring around it. Um, and then there'll be some rare earths in here as well, and no, no doubt some cobalt. Um, Tim Cook says e-waste in particular highlights how much throwaway culture needs to change. Even for high value electronic items, we buy it, we use it for a period of time, even if it's still serviceable, if it's considered to be obsolete or obsolescent, people want to get rid of it and get the, the newer or the bigger or the higher fidelity. Um, and it's a, it's a real shame because this is where it comes and it comes at a real cost to the community, to the consumer as well, but something they seem for now to be happy with. Council was an early adopter of the weekly FOGO Food and Organics Collection Service. It saved 10,000 tonnes of methane-producing food scraps and garden waste from landfill last year. Council composts the FOGO, locals get half, and the rest goes to municipal gardens. Show me what people put in your FOGO bins. The system has just one flaw. Some residents are rubbish at sorting rubbish. Is it frustrating? Very. Yeah, it's incredibly frustrating. Barry's dream is a carbon trading scheme rewarding emissions reduction and nature conservation. And Council is leading the way. From three of its capped landfills, 
Methane is captured and burned off as CO2. Carbon dioxide is still a greenhouse gas, but methane is 28 times more potent, 28 times worse for the environment. And so we partner with a, a company that uh, has basically installed that infrastructure. Um, the carbon uh, credit trading that they do um, pays for that itself. Bega's already home to a council and a range of businesses following some circularity principles. It's a good place to start at the region's bold, Barry-driven experiment. He thinks he's lit a fire that can't be put out, and the transformation coming the valley's way will be noticed on the world stage. I kind of want to make people jealous. I want, I want to make people come to the bigger valley and go, we should be like that. We should be doing that. But here in Bega, we will be world leaders. Late last year, the Regional Circularity Cooperative was launched and a model of the National Centre for Circularity to be built in Bega was unveiled. This is Australia's National Centre for Circular Discovery. Bega Group kicked in $5 million, the New South Wales Government $14 million. Because now circularity has a home. 40% of Australians have heard about circularity or circular economies, but only 24% know what it actually means. The National Circularity Centre, to be built in front of this beautiful lagoon, will be able to host school children, academics and staff from private and government organisations. The goal is to spark ideas, encourage collaboration and increase literacy about circularity. Talking about circularity and circular philosophy and how to make this into a building uh, was very, very difficult. So Celebrated architect Philip Cox built in an end-of-life plan so one day all the building's components will be recycled. And it's up to so it's a very exciting space to be in. Yeah. And Set to open in two years, Barry wants it to capture the imagination of not just Bega, but people from all over the globe this sort of running joke now that the project a few years old uh, is a little like Hotel California in the fact that you can check out, you can change roles, you can move to another country but you can't leave this project. 